Uh, it's always a pleasure to, to welcome David Ignatius uh, back to PNP, and it's a personal treat for me since um, he and I go back, go back a ways to our days together at, at the Washington Post. David first spoke at PNP 30 years ago uh, when his first book, a Agents of Innocence, was published, and he's returned to the bookstore to talk about uh, nearly uh, all, all the other uh, books since. The Quantum Spy marks his 10th novel. Uh, at the end of the acknowledgments in The Quantum Spy, uh, David recalls thinking that when Agents of Innocence came out, uh, he would have to choose between uh, being a journalist and being a novelist. Uh, he's glad he didn't, and I'm sure I can say that so are many of us. Uh, because David has managed so ably and consistently to use his journalism to inform and inspire his novel writing. Uh, to begin with, he's a absolutely first-rate reporter. Uh, he's been a columnist for nearly 20 years now, but he's never lost his um, uh, the reporting skills and, and instincts that he honed years before as a correspondent uh, for the Wall Street Journal and then as an editor in, in various capacities uh, at the Washington Post. As anyone who follows David's twice-weekly columns in the Post knows, uh, they're often filled with actual news, um, not just opinion, but actual news about national security affairs or global politics or, or economics. Earlier this year, for example, it was David who broke the story uh, that Michael Flynn had talked secretly with Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak last December. And if you're looking for a concise but complete rundown on Trump's dealings with Russia, dating back to the mid-1980s, you should read an extended column that David wrote earlier this month laying out the full history. His spy thrillers are rooted in the same expert reporting that has distinguished his journalism. David has a great knack for grounding suspenseful plots in real national security challenges. Uh, as I've said before about David's books, when you finish one, you're never quite sure how much of what's depicted might actually have happened, is happening at that moment, or may be about to happen. <laughs> this is also true of The Quantum Spy, which is set in the uh, high-stakes, high-tech world of computing. The story revolves around the race between the United States and China to develop a, a hyper-fast quantum computer capable of breaking any code, a competition that is likened in the book to the 20th century race to develop an atomic bomb. As the book begins, CIA agents entrap a Chinese computer scientist, hoping to get him to spy for the United States, only to discover that China itself has been receiving precious intelligence from a secret source inside the CIA. An intense hunt for the suspected mole ensues, taking a number of surprising turns. The book is not only entertaining, but instructive. Uh, I, for one, know a lot more about quantum computing now <laughs> than I ever thought I would. Or, or wanted to. Or wanted to. <laughs> it's really it's fascinating stuff. Um, and as with the best spy novels, this one leaves you feeling there are few happy, unscarred heroes in the complex world that actual spies inhabit. Uh, David's gonna talk for a while, then he'd be happy to take questions, not just about his book, but I'm sure about you know intelligence matters or Saudi Arabia or anything else. <laughs> but you might a ask him about opera, and you might not think normally to ask him about opera, but in addition to everything else that uh, he's been doing in the last few years, he wrote the libretto for an opera about Machiavelli called The New Prince that premiered last March at the Dutch National o Opera in Amsterdam. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming David Ignatius. That uh, introduction is, is wonderful, and the opera part, as unlikely as it sounds, is, is true, but I'll, I'll, you have to ask me questions to hear about it. Um, thanks to, uh, to my introducer, I, uh, Brad and I worked at the Washington Post on the foreign desk together. Uh, we used to joke sometimes that Bradley Graham had the ideal Washington Post name. You know, he, he, had, he had all the bases covered. Um, and uh, his wife, Lissa, is not here tonight, but also is a friend uh, going way back. 
Uh, as Brad said, this is a tradition for me. Uh, over 10 books, over 30 years, uh, I've come here uh, after publishing each book, and, and it's very special uh, to, to be able to talk about the books. Uh, this uh, is the last stop, really, on my, on my book tour. I've already uh, addressed audiences in Chicago and earlier this week in Boston. So this is kind of the, the end of the, of the process. I have to say, um, as, a, as a novelist, uh, the moment in which you're finally talking about the book um, is, is very precious. You go through this long period of waiting for it to come out. Uh, it, as I've said, I think, here in the past, uh, a book dies for the author the moment you finish the last word. It's been alive, just taken up all of your consciousness, and then it's gone. And it really only comes back once people are reading it. And the, the ideas that you had, the characters, the plot, uh, come, come alive in the minds of readers, and they experience it, and they tell you about it. And so that's always like it's this little baby coming back to life uh, in the moment of, of publication. I am very superstitious uh, uh, about each of my books. I get absolutely uh, petrified before publication. My wife, Eve, who's sitting here, uh, my mom and dad who were, who were here, and know that uh, you know, as I'm waiting for reviews for people to tell me whether this book is any good or not, uh, I really get, as I likened it to being afraid a p piano is about to fall in your head. You just kind of walk around, and then finally, uh, the reviews are in. Uh, for this book, they've been they've been very positive. There was a, a wonderful review in the Post on on Monday, um, and and more important than that, really, is what people say to me about about the book as as they read it. So it's 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 a, just a wonderful to make this uh, connection. I want to talk a little bit uh, tonight about um, m how I came to write fiction over these 30 years and then talk a little bit about this book and then I, as Brad said I'd love to, to take uh, questions from the audience. I became a novelist in my first novel Agents of Innocence uh, in 1987 because I had no other way to tell a story that I had just uh, wandered into. I just described this uh, some, some of you may have heard it before, but I'll just briefly uh, explain. In uh, February 1983, I published in the Wall Street Journal a story of how the CIA had recruited Yasser Arafat's chief of intelligence as an American asset and had run him for about 10 years. It was an amazing story. I'd spent more than two years reporting it. Uh, it appeared in the, in the newspaper, uh, as I say, in February 1983. It happened uh, on a day in April 1983, se several months later. Uh, I was at the American Embassy in Beirut uh, seeing someone, left the embassy uh, about 12.30, uh, just after 1 o'clock. The biggest car bomb anybody had ever heard in Beirut exploded at the embassy and killed the man who had run this operation, uh, <coughs> remarkable. CIA officer named uh, Robert Ames, uh, and uh, all of the people in the CIA station who were in Beirut that day. Um, I, as I said, had been working on this story for two years, so I knew the people who were involved in it. And in the aftermath of that uh, tragedy, as people struggled to deal with the loss of this man and the power that he represented, and, and really the beginning of the war, that's the day in my mind that this war that we're still living with began, they needed somebody to uh, grieve with. They needed somebody to talk, talk to about all this. And I was that person. It was a, just a weird accident for a, a journalist. And I began to learn more and more and just to absorb this story, this complicated narrative that stretched across the Middle East. And I thought, what on earth am I going to do with this? And the only answer I, I decided was to try to write a novel. So I worked on it and worked on it, and I had really terrible uh, luck. I, I wrote several drafts, and it, uh, it was rejected by every publisher I sent it to. And finally, uh, miraculously, Norton, there's a Norton representative who was here earlier tonight, 
uh, accepted it, uh, not because they wanted the novel, because they really didn't, but because they wanted me to write a nonfiction book. And that gave me the confidence to, to go back and make it good, to, to work on the characters, tell the story more powerfully. It came out in 1987, and, and uh, people, people really liked it. Um, when I first came to this bookstore to talk about that novel, I told everybody it was, it was made up. I, I, I spent the first couple of years uh, pretending that this was an invented imaginary story. Um, the people who knew how true it was were, you know, based at Langley, and also uh, working with Arafat. Arafat knew every detail of this, of this most, most details of the story. So um, over time, people began to say, you know, what's, what's qu quoted in some of the uh, uh, writings about my, my work, that the people at the agency said, although a, a novel, this story is not fiction. Uh, and I began to kind of uh, own that reality. Over each of the next books, I tried to uh, dig into s subjects that interested me, uh, how the United States, how the CIA had pulled at the threads of the Soviet Union uh, in the declining days of, of the Soviet Union, pulled at the republics like Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan. Uh, I, I got fascinated by the what I call the Bank of Fear, the, the Republic of Torture that Saddam Hussein was running uh, in Iraq and wrote a novel about that. I got fascinated by f the corruption that was woven through French life and French uh, activities overseas. I wrote a novel about that that so infuriated my French uh, publisher that they said this was an insult to the nation of France and they would never publish my work again. And, and you know, they didn't. Um, <laughs> They they took it they took it took it seriously. Wrote about Al Qaeda efforts to penetrate Al Qaeda. Wrote about uh, the Iranian nuclear program and trying to get inside of, of that. Wrote about drone warfare, and most recently in my last novel, wrote about the collision of hacking and espionage, uh, and imagined a, a, a world in which this, the the Russians had penetrated the libertarian WikiLeaks underground to manipulate uh, the United States. I mean, honest, uh, the, there was, in, in most of these books, I, I really am making guesses based on the evidence that I see. And novels allow me as a writer to say things that as a columnist, I really be hard to say. I don't have the hard evidence. It'd be hard for, for me to, you know, in, in columns these days in journalism, there's a live link. so you click on it and you, you, you get the real source material. Uh, for my last novel, The Director, or for the novel about manipulating the Iranian uh, nuclear program, you know, I, I was just, I understood what the, what the problem was, I understood what the issue was, but I, I couldn't have written it uh, as, a, a, as, a piece of, as a piece of journalism. So that, that's uh, allowed me over all these books to take uh, subjects that fascinate me take them, I hope, into, into another uh, uh, dimension. Uh, the tyranny of being a columnist is that you have 750 words. You know, if I really push, I get 760 words, but that's it. I, I'm not kidding. Um, and at the end of those uh, 750 words, I have to summarize what you should think about this issue, you know, in a simple prescriptive uh, conclusion. Writing fiction allows you to be faithful to how complicated things are. It, it allows you not to have to make a decision about, you know, yes or no, up or down, to, to paint on a much broader uh, canvas. Uh, I love that. I love being, being released from uh, having to, to tell you what, what, to, th what, what, to, what to think. Um, I have friends who've said over the years, David, the only time you really tell the truth is in your fiction. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I hope that's not true, but it does allow uh, me as a writer to tell uh, a different kind of, of truth, a different kind of, of story. So that's how I, I got into this business. Um, I'd be happy to speak about any of these books or the process if people have questions. Uh, just to say a few uh, words about, about this novel. I began uh, thinking about this very arcane, recondite uh, subject of quantum computing 
reading some of the documents that Edward Snowden uh, released, uh, published in the Washington Post and, and other uh, places. And one of those documents was the so-called black budget, the budget for the intelligence community's activities. And there was a line item in that that we published in the paper that made reference to an NSA, National Security Agency, program to develop a quantum computer. This was part of a broader program called the Penetrating Hard Targets program that the NSA was running. And we were putting, evidently, quite a lot of money into it. So I thought, that's, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, well, what, what, what is a quantum computer? Why, why are people in our intelligence community so interested in it? And as I read into it, this is a, 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 a way of, of computing where the normal uh, computer architecture is bits that are zero or one. A quantum computer is assembling bits that are qubits that are simultaneously zero and one that vastly multiply the connections and ability to, to uh, search for, for different uh, uh, solutions. So uh, the implications for in the intelligence world, the ability to essentially own uh, digital space, crack any code that could be created um, was, was powerful. And then further, as I, as I read into this, it, it, the race uh, to build this computer involved all the major U.S. Uh, IT companies, but also involved China that our principal competitors were the Chinese, who had set this as one of their targets for uh, future uh, uh, mastery of the key uh, uh, technologies. Uh, we just saw evidence of how seriously Ch China takes that in the speech that Xi Jinping made at the 19th Party Congress, where he just listed all the areas that China wants to dominate, from artificial intelligence to super supercomputing, including quantum computing, they've set that, set that landscape. So that, you know, again, as a novelist, I thought, okay, this is a really interesting technology. Let me find out enough about it that it won't be intrusive in the, in the plot. I can kind of know enough that to, to keep. And then let me find out about how the Chinese intelligence service operates. Uh, the Russian, the Soviet intelligence is, you know, mother's milk for, spy novelists. We all feel like we've, you know, walked around Moscow Center and we know just what Carla looks like and, you know, we're trying to see how Smiley figures out the, the, the latest Russian uh, challenge. But the Chinese um, have rarely been written about in, in spy novels. There are a few examples of quite, quite good uh, novels that have gone into this territory, but the Ministry of State Security is their intelligence agency is known as, is, uh, is um, uh, largely unexplored. So I began doing what uh, I do as a, as a novelist, trying to find the people who really understood this service, how it operated, uh, what kinds of people uh, were drawn into it, just its basic structure and, and tradecraft. And that, you know, that for me is the intense pleasure of, of writing these books, is, is doing that research. And I managed to find s several people uh, who not only uh, explain to me the basics of what I was after, but then once I'd written a draft of the book, agreed to read it carefully and say, you know, you got that wrong, and you know, I'd think about changing uh, this. And so uh, all those uh, pieces began to come together, um, but there's something that happens or, or doesn't happen sometimes that's the difference between something really being a novel uh, and not, and, and that's this uh, visualization of the characters uh, and, uh, and seeing the characters move through space. I, I, I sometimes liken it to the way a, you know, a, a rock just rolls down a, a path that's, that's there, so it just finds the, a natural path. But the, the, you, know, you have to get, get that process started, and that's often difficult for me. I, like I, uh, you think, I know what the story I want to tell, but how does it begin? How do these characters walk on stage? How do they introduce themselves to the reader? How do you hook the reader in, in the first first few pages, which is what you have to do in, the, in this kind of book? And I think any, I mean, I, I like novels that, that entertain. I, I don't like uh, novels that are too uh, technically difficult. So I, 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 for a few months, I just was trying to see how it opened and made some false starts. 
Uh, and I was on a trip to Singapore. Uh, I was in a hotel room on a place called Sentosa Island, just off the coast of Singapore. And uh, as anybody who's read the book knows, that's how the book opens. <laughs> uh, it, it, it opens in that hotel room where I was, and a Chinese-American uh, CIA officer walks into that room and, and pitches, uh, essentially blackmails, uh, Chinese uh, technologist who's working on their quantum computing programs and you know th and there it was and so the story began and, and then just as a writer I found that I raced through the next few months uh, even I had our first grand grandchild and we decided we just take you know get out of Washington go to Atlanta where our daughter was and take care of this baby so when I wasn't taking care of the baby I was back at the apartment we read it pounding out this crazy book and I'd go on long airplane trips and bear and you know the, the, there is a weird way for a novelist in which you know when it's when it's it's happening you just have to get out of the way and just just make sure you get as much of it on paper uh, in the time when it's when it feels uh, you know when the story is telling itself uh, as you can uh, final thing I want to say about this about this uh, book is is about the the hero the main character whose name is Harris Chang he is, as Brad said, a, a Chinese-American CIA officer. Uh, he is a, a heroic uh, person. He served in the U.S. Army in Iraq. Uh, much of the, what I've observed on my many trips to Iraq, I tried to weave into, into the story of this book. But as the Washington Post reviewer said um, on Monday, he is uh, shaped by a and, uh, in the end, deeply troubled by the uh, implicit, subtle racism uh, of uh, the agency first and second of the Chinese who were, who were trying to play him in, the, in their own way. Uh, each each are, are kind of seeing his uh, Chinese American heritage and trying to manipulate it. And that, and that pushes him uh, into a space where uh, the plot of the book really, really happens. And the, the other thing uh, that uh, the reviewer noted is, th is that the, the another p central character in this story is shaped by the by the sex sexism of, of the CIA, a, a woman a CIA officer who's experienced and really been been deeply upset by the ways in which women, uh, for so many decades, were given this work to do but not this work to do, and that ended up uh, being uh, crucial for her. So, uh, you know, those um, were, the, for me, the challenging uh, themes in trying to write the book, getting, getting characters who were complex, whose lives, you know, are, are not, you know, uh, cardboard cutouts, I hope, but uh, who experienced some of these uh, problems that, that, um, that, that matter, matter to people, I hope matter to, to, to readers. Um, let me close my uh, uh, comments just by going back to what uh, Brad uh, said in his introduction about this uh, feeling that I had 30 years ago that I had to, I had to ch make a choice. And uh, I felt it deeply at the, at the time. I, I, I'd had this success which was a, a surprise to me, I don't want to say a shock to me, because I, everybody had rejected the book when I first wrote it. But you know, here uh, people wanted me to write more books and, you know, and I, I thought, to, you know, to really be a novelist, I'm going to have to give up my job at the Washington Post. I'm going to have to walk away from this career as a journalist that, I, that I've loved uh, and, and take a risk on, on my ability to be a, a storyteller. And I say with a little bit of embarrassment that I just couldn't do it. Uh, I, I, I was too chicken. Uh, I had young children. I had tuition bills to pay. Uh, I was, I, I never felt, I don't feel even now, that m the readership for the kind of books that I want to write is going to be large enough to really, um, you know, pay all those bills. <laughs> so, so I, so I, so I didn't. And I, I kept my day job and I just struggled uh, over 10 books to carve out enough time uh, typically between jobs, the Washington Post, uh, moving from Outlook editor to Ford editor. Okay, uh, Ben, Len, can I have uh, three months between the two jobs? And then I'd go nuts in the three months and write a first draft, uh, which, you, you know, I'd, he remembers I'd get a little, you know, 
piece of paper and I'd mark every day uh, in the three months that I had how much I was going to complete and then try desperately to, to rewrite and, and edit, edit the book. And, um, you know, I think over time I learned better how to do that. I stretched out the time between books. I learned that the most important thing isn't so much the writing as the rewriting. You know, challenging yourself once, you, once you've written that first draft. It's got a long way to go. I, I said when I was here, uh, and forgive me for repeating it, um, but the, the essential thing that writers need is the person who will read their work that they worked so hard on. You know, just imagine, it's just, you know, especially when you're trying to carve it out from your other life. Read your work and then tell you honestly what they think of, of it. Um, and the person who's done that for me in every book is my wife Eve, who you know um, uh, loves me and you know knows how <laughs> much I want her to say this is great. Yeah, you really, you really did it. Uh, and I, it's it's so important that the people who we turn to for help are honest uh, and and tell us, as you said, really my last two books, this isn't this isn't there yet. You, this needs to be better, and you know that is so. It's so precious when you get that when you get that advice. Uh, and, you know, do it again. This this can be better than it than it is. I think that's you know as Brad and I know uh, as editors, you know, writers, reporters, they hate it when you say that. <laughs> I mean, who wants to hear that something isn't good enough? But that 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 that's that's the essential thing. So, you know, with. Um, uh, luck over these over these 30 years that's a long time I, I, I didn't choose uh, I did I did try to do both I'm, I'm entirely it's entirely possible that the novelist that I could have been uh, if I devoted myself to that full time um, you know never never just won't ever happen but I stayed writing spy novels certain kind of genre, genre fiction uh, you know I uh, in this opera I had a chance to really reach as a writer uh, but uh, but uh, but I did manage to to continue with my my journalism, and I have to say, in conclusion, this is a time in our business where you know, there, there are times when we wonder, you know, do we really make a difference? And you know, the, the uh, this is a world where uh, the efficacy of of the stories that we write, the, the idea that the truth is going to make a difference, you know, sometimes is in question. Sometimes hard to really b believe that uh, and in recent years I began to wonder if we really were making all that much of a difference I do not wonder about that right now I mean this is a, a time when every day when when I go to work but I'd say this about every person in the Washington Post building and at every news organization uh, that I that I know uh, and respect um, this is a time when we when we know we do make a difference so uh, again I'm glad I didn't, I didn't, in the end, I didn't choose because I would have, uh, if I had, not done one of these two things that I, that I really love. So let me end it there. I'd love to take questions. If anybody wants to ask about any goofy uh, topic of the day or journalistic issue, I'd be happy to talk about those two. Yes, Tim. David, that was superb, and I bought your book, of course. Excellent. And as Bradley said, you're the number one foreign policy, national security writer, speaker in Washington. I would broaden that to say in the United States of America. So having read, I'm going to read this book, and I've read your other ones, I really wonder if reading this helps me solve some of the questions that Bradley referred to. For example, will it help me when I'm so confused about what went on in your favorite country of Saudi Arabia? Was <laughs> it a coup d'etat by a 32-year-old guy? Uh, or was it just modernizing that old-fashioned wonderful place? Then I would ask you whether, was it a state visit by that wonderful president of Lebanon, or was the poor man <laughs> arrested and is finally going to escape to France where he'll have a glass of wine and get over it? And secondly, the foreign policy of the United States of America that you've been involved in 
and I've been involved in since the Kennedy administration, is it done out of the basement of the White House by this young son-in-law of, of the President of the United States <laughs> who was not successful in Queens in building buildings, but <laughs> hangs out till four in the morning with the new prince <laughs> and uh, is not coordinating with the State Department or Langley, well, our favorite friend. That's a good there. list of, of <laughs> yeah, uh, questions. That's three questions. <laughs> um, so uh, Tim Tal was an American ambassador overseas and also is an excellent tennis player. Uh, item two is, is more important in my book than item one. But um, So uh, just to say a few words about, about first Saudi Arabia. I uh, have been able to interview this 32-year-old, headstrong, not to say, you know, impulsive uh, young uh, crown prince. Uh, at length a couple of times. And I came to the conclusion after the first encounter with him uh, that as the headline writer said, uh, this is the young man who could jumpstart Saudi Arabia or drive it off a cliff. And uh, we're still trying to figure out which it's gonna be. Um, the positive side about him is that he sees a, a country that it desperately needs to be more modern, that, that has been stuck in this uh, consensual House of Saud, royal family politics that really uh, has blocked uh, the kinds of decisions that they needed to make. Um, it's been stuck uh, with a, a, an endemic corruption that I began writing about in 1981, uh, and is just a is a real drag on the kingdom's uh, ability to be that m a modern place. And it's been stuck in the bargain that the royal family made with the uh, conservative religious establishment, the ulama. And on each of those, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the young man, is a change agent. I mean, he's he's basically. Uh, shattering the, the old system. He, he, these arrests two weeks ago of, uh, we reckoned 11, at least 11, princes, four ministers, uh, you know, were unheard of in, in the kingdom. Um, but they go to the Ritz, don't they, rather than the... So, um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the danger is that, is that he is going to drive the country off, off a cliff, that the um, you know, there's a lot of uh, dissent among senior princes to what he's trying to do. Uh, my sense is that younger Saudis who um, are fed up with wealthy princes, uh, you know, at the, at the public trough, uh, draining the treasury, there's a lot of support among younger Saudis uh, for, for what he's trying to do. An example of, of the danger that he can do is, is uh, his push uh, against Iran, but really uh, against Lebanon. He, I told the story in detail last uh, Friday, uh, based on uh, sources in Lebanon, of what happened to the Prime Minister, Saad al-Hariri, kind of hour by hour on the way to this resignation uh, announcement the same day as all the arrests. And, uh, you know, he, he was uh, as I said, under virtual house arrest, if not formal arrest. Something really uh, uh, good has happened in the last few days, which is that for whatever combination of reasons, this is what my column tomorrow is about, so <laughs> now you don't have to buy the watch of us. Um, uh, Mohammed bin Salman and company appear to have pulled back a little bit from these very uh, dramatic and I think dangerous actions. And, you know, the first thing I say in this column is that uh, they're going to be, in effect, plea bargains with the 208 people who were arrested, where, you know, if you uh, swear allegiance and, you know, pay restitution, it's over. It's not going to. So I think that's probably a stabilizing factor. Uh, the e even better, from my standpoint, as somebody who really loves Lebanon, uh, I think Saad Hariri should already be either uh, in France or on his way. Uh, and 
will soon be on its way back to Lebanon. Uh, Eve, I guess you've already gone to work, but I sp open my day talking to people in Lebanon who just feel an immense sense uh, of, of, uh, uh, of relief. Sad Sadriri, who was not the most successful prime minister, is now a national hero in, in, in Lebanon. He, he embodies the Lebanese desire to be a real country, to have sovereignty again. So um, that's a, that's a long-winded uh, 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 account of this. I think uh, Americans um, have a stake in the success of what this young man is trying to do. You know, I, 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 I mean, I'll be honest. He, uh, he, he's a, he, he could drive the place off a cliff, but those are the, he's, the changes he's talking about, I would say, are the, are the right ones. So when you, when you read about him, bear in mind both, the, the off the cliff and the jump start. Yeah. Could you speak a little bit about the implications of the hack of the NSA? Should we be more concerned that we can't defend our most secret agency or that there's an inside job of some kind? What disturbs you most? Um, you know, I, uh, both, are, both are disturbing. The, the New York Times had a, a, just a superb um, account of uh, just how, how many of the NSA's most precious secrets have now um, e either been hacked or, uh, you know, uh, uh, stolen by the Russians and then repurposed into this uh, underground. The, the, there's a group called Shadow Brokers that is uh, taking these, you know, NSA um, uh, malware tools that they've used to pry secrets all over the world and just putting them out uh, in ways that are genuinely dangerous uh, for, for our companies, for the whole, for the whole world. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what's going on? How are these secrets getting out? And, you know, I, I, I guess I, since I don't know the answer, I just note the, the issue that I think is, is really an interesting, difficult one. Um, the NSA has been successful in, in attracting the smartest kids, the young hackers. If you go, as I did, to the hackers convention <laughs> called DEF CON, they actually have a convention, and you kind of wade through all the sea of black t-shirts, and uh, you, you'll see that uh, our government agencies are there recruiting big time. And it, if you go to Fort Meade and you know, go interviews, you kind of walk in the, in the door after you go through all the security and you see a lot of those kids in black shirts and, uh, you know, and, and long hair and they look, you know, it doesn't look like what the NSA, you, you know, you'd imagine, it's not buttoned down. So they've been successful in getting these kids in. Um, to, be, to be able to operate in this world, uh, these, are, these are the kinds of talents that, that you need, but to, to keep secrets from hemorrhaging out, you need controls that are going to make the NSA or any of these other places uh, tough places for a creative young person to work. I mean, you know, who's going to want to work in a place where people are just sitting on your shoulder 24-7, everything you do, everything you look at, it's just, you know, let's, let's be honest. So I think that's been the, it's a very delicate balance. It may be that the technology will be able to, in a non-intrusive, not, not over overwhelmingly intrusive way, be able to monitor what people are doing so the, the, this uh, breach of secrets uh, will, will be reduced. But I, I think it's a great question. It's mm -hmm. one that uh, I think thoughtful folk, people should really pay attention to, not just leave it for, mm -hmm. for, the, for the intelligence community. Uh, yes, sir. All right, thanks. I think this is a step back from the realm of really good questions like the, the last one, good serious questions, to the realm of the go goofier questions, to use your word, uh, when you asked us to come up to the mics. Um, and it has to do with your, uh, the issue of being having one foot in the, in the fiction world and one foot in the journalistic world. And uh, uh, the idea of having apprehension when you publish uh, a novel. Do you ever do you have ever have apprehension along any of these lines? For example, that you'll give bad people good ideas, <laughs> or for example, that you'll um, maybe uh, violate some trust with a uh, close source that you have, or uh, well, or any anything else along those lines. That the line between fiction and uh, and fact 
uh, and recognizing that your knowledge of the facts is extremely deep and that there's the possibility that you would y incorporate into fiction, into a novel, an idea that you don't know for sure to be true, but you think it's so impossibly true and so enticing, you can't resist putting it into the, uh, into the novel. So is that, it's kind of a trick question, because no, if, you say, <laughs> if you say no, there's no risk there, then we'll say, well, it's obviously not very realistic uh, fiction writing. <laughs> But if you say, uh, yeah, then, yeah, there, I think about that all the time, then we'll think maybe you're being irresponsible. So <laughs> somewhere in between those two. So um, it's, it's a great question. Um, the, the way that I answer it sometimes in, in my uh, author's note at the end of a book, the way that I answer it in my own mind uh, is, um, Anybody who, who takes anything that I've written as a recipe book uh, is going to make a mud pie and not a not a uh, layer cake. I mean, the uh, I uh, the things that I le I learn. Uh, I, I th th I'm not sneaky about this. I, you know, I, they're pretty straightforward conversations. Um, the pe people don't generally talk about um, uh, big secrets with journalists, and they shouldn't. Um, I think the issue that y you're uh, touching on, and I don't, I don't finally kn uh, know the answer to this, but I, I want to acknowledge the, that the question is a real one. Um, so I'm thinking about um, the interesting question of what the United States would do if it wanted to intervene in the supply chain uh, uh, for the Iranian nuclear program and, and uh, in some way um, uh, uh, subtly sabotage that program. It's an obvious question. It's one that's been explored you know, by novelists in various ways. And I think about that and I assemble a plot in the, my novel, The Increment, uh, that just draws on things and I kind of, you know, think, well, what's, what, what, what would be the, the issues if you're the Iranians that would be the toughest nuts to crack? And so I'll think, well, you know, it's a lot of putting a nuclear weapon together has been written about. And, uh, you know, but, but, you know, the interesting, difficult part is getting the trigger, the neutron trigger that's going to drive the elements of the bomb together. And so, yeah, maybe I'll make that my kind of MacGuffin that, uh, you know, the, the Iranians will be, will be working on that. And then you know, I think about, well, how is, sp so if you were in uh, an Iranian uh, lab in the Tons and you, cou you can't take a, nobody will take a flash drive and plug it into their machine, so how, how would you actually transfer data I into their machine in a way? So I've just, I'm making, you know, I'm just playing with that idea. And, um, you know, the, uh, there's a, a question of whether you make too many good guesses, and and somebody would just assume that, that these aren't guesses at all. The uh, all I can say is that is that they are guesses. Uh, the fun of a novel is the, the you know the parts of it that, that feel plausible, but the, often those are the ones that are that are entirely I imagined. My first novel, which as I say was drawn from fact, uh, the the part that people kept thinking was was real I keep asking me about was uh, a sort of dead drop uh, uh, collection in Syria and I'd been to a bunch of places in Syria so I kind of you know wove it around that and but people kept saying you know, how did you get you know, it was completely I imaginary so um, again I, I don't want to I don't want to trivialize the 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 the, the, the the question, because um, it, it, it's a real one. If I started being too careful, I couldn't write my fiction. I've never had anybody in, you know, in in government say, "Oh my gosh, that was, you know, w terrible." But then they wouldn't, would they? So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I, I just it's a, it's a non-trivial question, um, and um, as I say, I, you're, you're, these are basically will will make you mud pies. Um, not uh, cakes or souffles. Yes. Uh, David, um, 
I enjoyed uh, the director. I'm looking forward to this book also. Um, I feel I know you, though, for a different reason. I'm a every morning watcher of uh, Morning Joe. <laughs> and I've always wanted to ask somebody on the panel, how do you deal with it or how frustrating it is when Joe Scarborough says, all right, David <laughs> Ignatius, and then he starts to ask a quite coherent question, but then three or four minutes later, he is still talking, and, it, and at that point, it's not clear what the question is. Now, you do very well with it, but how do you do that? So, um, <laughs> the, uh, so it's an advantage, uh, weirdly, uh, to be at a remote location. I usually uh, do this from Washington. So uh, it's harder to interrupt somebody um, when they're not sitting next to you. <laughs> uh, as, you know, you can't you can't really talk over people when they're when they're remote. Um, you know, I the reason that I have grown to really enjoy being on that on that show is that I I feel as if um, the, the host Joe and Mika let people say their thing. I mean, they don't invite me on to interrupt me. They invite me on to say my thing, mm -hmm. and um, you know I think that's become more true over time. Um, there's got to be a reason. I mean, you know, they're, they're, you know, there's a chemistry between them that's now obvious. Their engagement is announced. Um, uh, but there's got to be a reason that, that so many people uh, watch that show. I've said to, to Joe that um, I think they become, we used to all, as journalists, uh, read the AP day book. Brad remembers. That's how we'd set up our day. You know, the AP would publish a list of the sort of things, the news making things that were going to happen that day. And then we'd, we'd take our cues from that. And, and uh, that show has kind of become the, the AP day book. It, it, it's, you know, the people who, who are going to shape that day's um, uh, set of themes often will want to be on the show. The producer of the show is, I think, is brilliant at kind of figuring out this is what people are going to want. Um, and uh, I think for a while, Trump was watching it and then <laughs> literally sometimes I think you know texting uh, uh, Joe was very plugged into into uh, that seems to be less less true now um, the other thing I'll say is um, the the, I, the only reason I really got started uh, on that show was because of my friendship with um, Mika's dad uh, as big Brzezinski mm -hmm. and uh, you know I think maybe because he was, you know, beginning to, you know, court Mika, uh, he wanted to have her dad on the show, and um, he wanted somebody who could kind of, you know, finish the conversation, ask, ask the next question, and uh, put his big at ease. And so I became that sort of person. I was like the bag carrier, you know, <laughs> sentence finisher. And um, and so I, that's, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I miss, uh, he, he was such a, Great man, and uh, but that's that's how that whole thing got started. Okay, thank you. Yes, I've always uh, been intrigued and and fascinated by your characters, and this drops back in time to a very brief exchange we had some many years ago about Hani Pasha. Does Hani. that ring a bell? It, it in, indeed, Hani 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 as the as the Jordanian say Hani Basha. Okay. Um, at the time, he had, uh, at age 53, if I remember the particulars, had been uh, found uh, dead of a heart attack in a hotel room in Europe, someplace I can't remember where, um, which raised the question in probably everybody's mind who was connecting your, your novel and the realities, uh, some of which were in the novel. Um, has anything ever come out about whether that was truly a a heart attack, and he just passed away at that age, or was that encouraged? <laughs> so I don't know any reason to think that that was that, that was a uh, foul foul play. Mm -hmm. um, this the man that we're describing, who was the, the base for the uh, character in the book, who's who's called uh, Hani Basha, who ran the in, in my fiction ran the Jordanian uh, Mukhabarat, the GID as it's called. Uh, the real life model um, was one of the most gifted uh, intelligence officers the Arab world has produced. But he also was a, was a very flawed human being. 
And uh, in the years after he got uh, sacked as head of the, his service, ran afoul of, of King Abdullah, uh, he entered a very difficult period. You know, like a lot of people in that business, he, he liked to have a, a, a drink, and that, and that became a problem. And so I uh, wrote in, uh, after he died, uh, in this hotel room in Vienna. Uh, I, I wrote a column in which I said, here's how the James Bond story ends in real life. When I say this man was a, was a great uh, intelligence officer, I mean, I'll just describe the real um, moment that uh, I, I sketched, uh, drew upon in, in, in the novel. Um, they had identified a prospective target in Al-Qaeda uh, and had worked this man's file you know, for months to just know everything about him. A and this uh, officer you know, found the person in an East European city, knocked on his door, put his foot in the door so he couldn't close it, and handed a cell phone through the door to this Al-Qaeda operative, and s who was Jordanian, and said, talk to your mother. And on the other end of it, the phone, was this man's mother. And she said, you know, oh my darling, I always knew that you'd be somebody important. <laughs> and today, you know, I have my new apartment, I have my beautiful television set, all these incredible things that you've given me and done for me, and I'm so proud of you. I love you so much. You know, he hands the, hands the phone back, and that's it. He's, he's hooked. You know, it was a brilliant recruitment. You know, I mean, getting into Al-Qaeda uh, was something. So, uh, you know, when I say this guy was James Bond, he, he, was, he was a really skilled but in, in life, he was, he was deeply flawed, and he ended up, the last time I saw him in a restaurant in, uh, in, in Amman, he practically fell over. He was just not in good shape. And he ended up, as I say, just, just dying alone. I don't think this was a foul play. Um, you know, one, just to close this, I, one thing that I, I hope that I do in my f fiction is, you know, uh, that people who do these operations and risk, risk their lives um, to try to you know, penetrate these, these groups, you know, it's, it's, it's worth um, telling their, their stories and, and you know, criticizing them when they do bad things. But you know, the person I initially talked about, Robert Ames, and this Jordanian gentleman, you know, I mean, you know, th um, <coughs> they saved a lot of American lives. And uh, people just sort of need to remember that as we, as we deal with all the other issues that are involved in oversight of intelligence. Yes, sir. I'd like to ask you <coughs> about um, one of your recent columns earlier this week about the president's trip to Asia, <laughs> which I think, to paraphrase what I think you said, it was all sizzled and no steak. But <coughs> um, try as we might to understand, you know, North Korea and China, I mean, we don't really understand a lot about it. I'd be very curious about your take Xi is now, he's consolidated his power. Um, North Korea is a player in a way that they've never been before uh, in a perverse sort of a way. What are we to make of all of this from your perspective in terms of what's happening in China and North Korea? Um, I, I was pretty blunt in, in, this, uh, in this column. Uh, the last line was that I, uh, watching the president's trip, I feared we were watching an American that retreat <coughs> Uh, accompanied by a shiny brass band. Uh, I think Xi Jinping uh, is the most effective political leader in the world today. Uh, he has consolidated his power in a way that I find startling. Uh, over five years, he has essentially um, tossed out a whole generation of leaders in both the party and the Chinese military and installed his own people. I, I ran through the numbers in a recent column, but I'll just note, 1.5 million party members have been disciplined in the last five years. Um, 
270,000 have formally been prosecuted for corruption. 13,000 Chinese military officers have been prosecuted for corruption. 50 flag officers in the Chinese military, each of the services, have been prosecuted. And so, so it's a whole new team that's Xi's team. The Chinese are moving really aggressively into the commanding heights of the technologies that will be decisive, yes, in the commercial spheres, but also in the military sphere. I mean, their advances uh, in, the, in the ability to sort of ta take out uh, space systems to uh, hypersonic uh, uh, weapons, just a whole range of new technologies, they're, they're really s serious about. And so they're, they're um, becoming a significant player. The Russians are also advancing much more rapidly than, than they did for all their year, the years where they kind of were asleep after the end of the Cold War. Um, my worry about, about this, this trip was that it, it symbolized um, essentially an American acceptance of this very powerful uh, China as, a, as, a, as she put it, you know, the Pacific is big enough for both of us and the Chinese basically have already carved out their zone in the South China Sea and there, we just, I, I, it's not that I want us to go into a new Cold War footing with China and Russia. I just um, think that we need to really be quite um, aware of their ambitions to project power and to make good decisions as a country about how we, how we deal with that. And, um, you know, t Trump, I, I had this Latin, you know, I came, I saw, I flattered, uh, <laughs> translated in, in, the, in the Latin in the, in the lead of this column. Um, a, as, I, as, I, as I noted, I, th I think this trip will be remembered as the moment in which the United States basically accepted Chinese power uh, in, in the new Asia. That probably was inevitable over time, you know. It's but but I th you have to be you, you don't want to pat yourself on the back for, and and you don't want to be t too. Um, you have to be careful about 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 uh, about being being played. That's that's my feeling. Yes, sir. Hi, yourself accepted. Who are the spy novelists that you most respect, and why? So, um, I, 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 when I'm asked this question, I always begin with an homage to the person that I read most faithfully, uh, who I often turn to when I'm beginning a novel, um, just to see how he sets up his story and his characters, and that's Graham Greene, you know, who was a spy novelist, but was also a, just a, a great novelist. Uh, he was an intelligence officer himself, he had an intuitive feel. Um, but you know th those are, are novels that I just I, I find uh, exciting. You know I I um, like uh, I think anybody who reads spy novels. Uh, am a student of John Le Carre. Uh, he defined the genre. I love the Smiley novels. Uh, I as he got angrier, I think he became a less compelling novelist. I think his later novels, where villains are mostly Americans, and you know I I don't. I don't like those books as much. His latest book, Legacy of Spies, I reviewed for The Atlantic. It's a wonderful book. If you like um, uh, the Le Carre of the Smiley novels, this is kind of a class reunion. And um, Smiley makes a brief appearance, but it, it's really uh, about, uh, about other, other characters who are part of the, 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 the canon. Uh, I like um, the author of Red Sparrow, I think is his first book. Jason Matthews is, is that his name. Former CIA officer, um, his tradecraft is just so astonishingly good. You know, he makes uh, other novelists feel especially inadequate. I think of, you know, you're, you're, I wish I could write the authority as he does about sh short range the SHRAC, I forget what the A is stands for, but this communication system that's used o on the ground in the way that Jason Matthews does in his books. Um, they're much raunchier than my books. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of sex in, in uh, uh, but, they're, but they're funny as a new book that's, uh, that's coming in, in March. Um, who else do I like to read? Uh, you know, I like Alan First, the atmospherics of his books. Um, 
I increasingly find that uh, you know I'll, I'll I'll read some fiction, but I'm getting hooked on on uh, his historical narrative. I'm just reading now the new Ron Chernow biography of, of Ulysses S. Grant, and you know the, I find those books are just deeply uh, satisfying. Uh, my colleague Rick Atkinson, um, who Brad and I work with at the Washington Post, uh, wrote uh, just a spectacular. Um, trilogy about World War II in Europe. Um, he's now f finish, finishing the first volume of what will be a trilogy about the Revolutionary War. Um, you know, I can't recommend those books highly enough. Ian Toll is writing a trilogy about the war in the Pacific. He's written two volumes. My dad, uh, who's here, served in the largest naval battle in history, in the Battle of Lady Gulf, which is beautifully rendered uh, by, uh, by Ian Toll. So that my um, my reading is is you know Catholic, um, but I just I, I, I read every night. Um, you know, sometimes I, I wake up in the middle of the night, and my glasses are still on, and I think, <laughs> oh man, you know, <laughs> you didn't didn't get very far to tonight, did you? So that's that's my list. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Samira Daniels. I'm uh, looking forward to your book. I. Um, you, uh, you mentioned Dr. Brzezinski, and I miss him myself, too. Uh, Dr. Brzezinski wrote a book in the uh, 70s about the uh, uh, sort of the culture that was going to emerge as a consequence of technology. And I th what he was trying to say at that point was that, you know, maybe we're going to sort of drain the uh, energy out of adventure and so forth. and because it, we were becoming so quantified and uh, technological that, you know, the, ex the, the range of experience, ironically, would be less rather than more. And, and, and why he made that uh, assumption, you know, is that's the book. And I, I just wonder whether, uh, coming to the present, w uh, whether you think that th this, this emphasis on cyber and you know you mentioned the hacking and you know young people are trying to hack and so forth and yet our our narratives uh seem to you know be back in the 70s i mean you know the things uh, you, you know you mentioned graham green i mean the idea of the intelligence community is still sort of 70s from my my perspective and i know they're trying to make some correctives with some new programs and you know but uh, would you say that the uh, communities are sort of uh, uh, going, becoming healthier? I mean, our, our conflict resolution, for example, is that uh, going to be uh, even important, uh, given that the, you know the, all these cyber, techno you know, these, uh, this new uh, environment, cyber environment, has come into force. So that, that's a wonderful question. A good, good one to to uh, to end on. Um, Zbig uh, is, was somebody I admired uh, for many reasons, but one of the uh, reasons I admired him most was that he, he um, ha had a contrarian streak. He, you know, he often tacked away from the fleet. He was prepared to be unpopular. He was early to say there just has to be a, a resolution of the Palestinian issue, and it was very unpopular. He was attacked. But he, but he, 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 he kept uh, kept saying that he was uh, almost alone among prominent foreign policy uh, Dr. experts. Dr. Yes. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, in 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 warning about the dangers of the invasion of Iraq, he and Brent Scowcroft just said, um, losing a lot of friends, losing their place at the table, said, "Don't do this." Um, one of the real uh, pleasures of my career was when I was asked by the two of them to moderate a series of conversations that became a book that was published in 2008 yeah, I was that called all America, <laughs> America and the World. So um, one of the things that Zbig said uh, in that book and, and began developing in, in his writing was the idea that we were entering a period that he called the, the global political awakening, awakening or uprising. But the, the, what he was saying was that Technology and other changes, other dislocations, were empowering citizens around the world in a way that was going to be, you know, very destabilizing. It was like the Great Awakening in, uh, in our uh, 19th century history, and uh, he saw it coming, 
and began thinking about what it would mean for foreign policy. It was one reason he just felt that it was crucial to get out ahead of some of these some of these issues. Um, I, I think um, the deeper question that that you raise, um, and I'll just conclude with this. Um, what we're finding is that the, the, this incredible empowering technology that, that gives each citizen around the world in the palm of their hand access to, to the world, at connection, connectivity to people, ideas. You know, you know, I, I felt as the Tahrir Square uprising was happening, it was this assertion by people, I'm a citizen, I have rights, you know, I, you know, don't, I, don't push me around anymore. And you see that um, uh, in so many places. I feel as if it's there in Russia and China, but it's not so visible. And you know, how that'll play out, I don't know. What we've seen in our country, in Europe, is that this technology in empowering citizens also s seems to be um, uh, make it more difficult uh, f f to govern. That the empowered citizen is just is is more polarized. Is our, our political system, those in Europe, are just are being, uh, in weird ways, undermined. And I've begun thinking recently, there's got to be a way to take this technology that empowers you but makes you angry, uh, you know, makes you get, get furious at Washington, uh, enable you as a citizen to solve problems, not just bitch about them, exactly. not just connect with other people who are angry, but to, you know, to... to do so that it fix this problem that you're, you know, so it, it ought to be possible to get more government, governance into your, into your phone, if you will, uh, you know, in, in, in the future so that it's connecting you but it's also, you know, genuinely empowering you to, to so you, you solve the problems that, that upset you. So that, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, if I make a mistake, it's in general in my journalism and my fiction to be too optimistic. And I probably just gave you an example because uh, a lot of people are technophobes, but I'll, I'll end by saying, um, here's to the empowered handset of the future. <laughs>